Welcome to the latest in our Innovation at Work webinar series, uh, Deep Dive, brought to you from MIT Sloan Executive Education, where I have the honor of being the uh, Senior Associate Dean uh, in Executive Education. It's great to see all the different places around the world uh, that you're coming in from. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening. We're so delighted that you are able to uh, join us. We hope you are all uh, well and safe in these uh, ongoing challenging times. Uh, we're very lucky today to be joined by my colleague, uh, Dave Robertson, who is a senior lecturer in operations management at the MIT Sloan School. And Dave is going to talk to us about uh, his work around uh, product uh, innovation and digital product management. Uh, Dave is a senior lecturer at the MIT Sloan School of Management. Over his career, he's been a consultant at McKinsey. Uh, he's been an executive himself at both small and larger technology companies. He's hosted a radio show. Uh, he's taught at IMD and at Wharton, and we're delighted that uh, he has come back to MIT where he obtained his PhD and his uh, MBA earlier in his career. Dave's also the author uh, of some highly acclaimed books, including uh, one I think we're showing you on the screen at the moment, uh, where he has studied really in great depth uh, the Lego uh, company and how they have managed uh, innovation. Uh, so today, uh, I'm very delighted again, Dave, that you've been able to join us. We really appreciate having you here. Uh, as Paola mentioned for format, Dave is going to speak for perhaps about 20 minutes to introduce some of his work, uh, and then we'll move to, uh, to Q&A. Uh, so please feel free to put questions uh, into the Q&A function uh, as we go along. I will uh, monitor those and come back in a little while and help uh, Make sure we get to your questions and feel free to uh, comment in the chat as well as things go along. But if you've got specific questions you'd like Dave to address, do try to put them in the Q&A. So with that, uh, if we could switch the screen share, please, over to Dave and I'll hand him the stage and let him take it away. Thanks, Dave. Okay, thank you, Peter. Uh, now, just checking, can you see the uh, box surrounded by the colored panels? What if a great product isn't enough? Yes? Okay, yes. good. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, my research, what I've been focusing on for the past 15 years. Uh, I, I did, as Peter mentioned, I, I wrote a book about Lego and how uh, Lego turned itself around, how they almost went bankrupt and how they turned itself around. And I'll tell you a little bit about that story, um, but I want to make this as interactive as we can. And so let me uh, just ask you to, um, we're gonna use some polls and I like this tool called Mentimeter. Um, and so uh, what I like, the reason I like Mentimeter is number one, it gets us kind of interacting and I can see some of what you're thinking about this. And, but the other thing too is uh, one thing we've all become far too familiar with over the past you know, 12 to 15 months is uh, Zoom and uh, that kind of uh, screen hypnosis. Zoom hypnosis. And one of the things I like about Mentimeter is you pull out your smartphone and you take your focus away from the screen a bit. And I think that can be uh, very healthy and kind of wakes us up. So please do um, on your smartphone, go if you can, or just open up another window on the browser and go to menti.com and enter the code 11626264, right? menti.com 11626264. Type your answers there, but then come back to this screen and you'll see the answers to the presentation. So let's see where we are so far. Okay, so I asked the question, what type of product or service are you, is your company known for? And so keyboards and mice, is there somebody here from Logitech? Lingerie, um, productivity solution. I saw a lot of people from Switzerland. And as Peter mentioned, I raised my kids in, uh, in a small town outside of Lausanne. The space station. Wow. Wonderful. Package holidays, productivity solutions. Wonderful. Okay. We'll come back to this, uh, but uh, thank you for that. Um, and as Peter mentioned, I wrote a book about Lego. Um, I spent five years of my life wandering around the world of Lego because I thought Lego was this interesting story of a company that had done very well in its early years, you know, after the invention of the brick and so forth. They did quite well. And then they hit some problems and almost went bankrupt in 2003, but learned something from that and came back stronger than ever. And so the reason I devoted, uh, you know, so much of my time to Lego and wrote a book about it 
was because they've tried just about every approach to managing innovation that you can, and some resulted in spectacular success and others in near bankruptcy, you know, definitely crisis. And so uh, I wrote a follow-on book that Peter mentioned, uh, The Power of Little Ideas, in response to a presentation very much like this one, where somebody asked me, uh, well, you know, we're not almost bankrupt, but we'd like to do some different things in innovation. How could we do what Lego did? And so I challenged myself to write a second book, which didn't mention Lego, and did talk about kind of what is the process. And that's really the, um, the goal of, of the program that I lead at MIT, the innovation in existing markets, is to talk about, you know, how would you do what Lego did? So let me just talk about this. And by the way, uh, I've stopped apologizing uh, for being so Lego focused. I was the Lego professor of innovation. Um, my son uh, and daughter never suffered from a lack of Lego. Um, and my son just graduated from uh, uh, Carnegie Mellon with a master's in mechanical engineering. Um, and so uh, I'm a big believer that Lego is the best investment you can make in your kid's ability to support you when you're older. Uh, so I'm kind of living that. Um, and, uh, and so let me kind of give you a little bit of the history uh, because it's relevant to how Lego got themselves in such trouble. Um, so the brick was invented by this guy, Godfrey Kirk Chris Johnson. Uh, he's the son of the founder of this small little Danish uh, carpentry shop uh, that started in the 30s. But he moves it to uh, plastic toys in the 50s, patents the brick in 58, um, steadily moves toward brick-based toys, and grows the company only very slowly over the next 20 years. Um, in the late 70s, he, in a gradual process, turns the management of the company over to his son, uh, Kjell Kirk Christiansen. And Kel Kirk had just come back from getting his MBA at a business school and had all kinds of ideas about ways to boost growth at Lego and just fought like hell with his father. I mean, really, they did not see eye to eye. Uh, young Kel Kirk wants to do all kinds of innovative, uh, aggressive things to really boost Lego. And his father is, you know, grew up in the depression, never took a loan out and uh, really fights him at every step. So when young Kel Kirk takes over management of the company, at age 32 in 1978, he unleashes a wave of innovation um, that really launches Lego into the company that we know today. Um, he does a number of things. Uh, Duplo, the, the Lego, the bigger bricks for smaller children, you know, so you can give it to a, say a two or three year old and not have to worry about them swallowing it. Duplo had been launched a couple of years before and had done quite well. And so Kelkirk began to think, well, what if we could launch a line of toys that was more sophisticated so we could bring in teenagers. And so launches Technique in uh, 1977. Um, creates the first minifigure, which changes the whole play experience in 1978. And then launches the first fantasy sets, the space and castle sets. That was the first time that Lego had made a set that wasn't set in a present day town and village. Lego before 1978 was all about you know, uh, police stations, fire trucks, uh, things like that. And so those sets were immensely popular. And so Lego goes on this 15 year period of 14% annual growth, right? I mean, it's becoming a, a really great company. It makes a very high quality brick. It makes some wonderful play themes. They expand the play themes into say pirates, wild west, robots, trains, et cetera. They come into North America and basically double in size every five years for 15 years, right? This is great. This is kind of, you know, I, I think most of us would be very happy if we had that kind of uh, growth and success. But then it stopped, right? And so, you know, that, that string ran out. And one of the things that we talk about in the innovation and existing markets course is that no innovation lasts forever, right? They, they run their course. And sometimes you get, you know, hyper growth for a couple of years. Sometimes you get steady growth for longer. Um, and Lego, you know, it's just, there's only so many, you know, linear feet or meters of shelf space for toys and their string ran out. So growth in the 90s stopped. But let me ask you, and I'll go back, what would you do to restart growth, right? So go back to menti.com, enter the code, and I'm going to come back and... 
move to the next. What would you do if you were leading Lego in the 1990s, right? So let's pretend you're Kel Kirk Chris Johnson. You are the grandson of the founder. It's a family owned business in Billund, Denmark, which is this tiny little town. It is literally a company town. And you've been leading the company for 15 years and growing at 14% per year on average. And then all of a sudden you're getting no growth in the 90s. Revamp the marketing. Internationalize. Well, they've just done that. They've just internationalized. Let's see. Customer research. Yeah, go, go out and talk to your customers. Watch children, especially. Yeah, the customer is interesting, right? I mean, you've got the stores that retail it. You've got the parents that often buy. Um, you've got the kids who play. Focus on what's happening in society. Well, 90s is, uh, ask McKinsey. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I spent five wonderful years at McKinsey. My father called that the dark side of my career. Um, create an internal startup, co-brand with movies. Interesting. Well, I'll tell you what they did. What they did is something that many companies have done as I've studied this, this is usually the default response, which is that when, if, when growth slows down, um, there's often a product proliferation, what some have called the disease of more. And I, I checked and I actually got the catalogs. I counted the number of new toys each year. There was 109 new Lego sets in 1994. There was 347 in 1998. In other words, it more than triples. Um, and you know, this is a common response, right? If one new product is good, then two new products is better. Um, but basically all that happens is their cost structure goes up, their production complexity, supply chain complexity, distribution complexity, all that goes up. But what doesn't go up is sales costs go down and of course profits go down. Lego has never lost money in its entire history until 1998. And they, they have to lay off a thousand people. And again, you know, the, the guy running the company, Kel Kirk Chris Johnson, he is the grandson of the founder. He's representing um, the family fortune, right? The family business. Um, and this is a family business in a company town in a tiny little town, Bill in Denmark. Uh, I think it only has 19,000 people to this day. And most Lego, Lego employees drive in from somewhere else because it's so boring to live there. Um, so, you know, he, uh, he ends up coming around to what many of you were suggesting. Um, that maybe we've become a little separated from what's happening in the market and what our customers are doing. Um, but also he has a real crisis of confidence. You know, he says, I've been running this company for 20 years. Remember he took over in the late seventies. He says, I've been running this company for 20 years, 15 of them quite well, but maybe I'm not the right guy to run this for the next 20 years. So he brings in a turnaround expert guy named Paul Plowman. He's just turned around Bang & Olufsen, who's a high-end Danish consumer electronics company. And Paul goes out and talks to customers, talks to retailers, looks what, what's happening. He you know, leads a team out into the market. And what he finds is that one thing is happening, the play experience is changing, right? There's PlayStation, there's Nintendo. Xbox doesn't come out for a few more years. Um, and, you know, kids are moving from the physical to the digital, and it's affecting all toys, not all traditional toys, right? Not just um, Lego, but Barbie, Hot Wheels, uh, Meccano, uh, et cetera. I mean, any Lincoln Logs, any, any traditional toy is feeling the, the move of kids from physical play experiences to virtual or digital play experiences. But another thing is happening. In the U.S. Uh, strongly, but in other companies, you know, European companies, France, Germany, England, um, the rise of the big box retailer is really changing the balance of power for toy makers. You know, uh, Toys R Us is at the peak of its powers in the U.S., and they are going to Lego and saying, you know, no, we're not going to carry that. You know, Lego before used to go to that small mom and top pop toy store and say, you know, this is what you should carry. But now uh, big companies like Toys R Us, Walmart, Target in the US have very sophisticated retailing groups who are telling Lego um, why people are buying and what they should be making. 
you know, so they know more about the customer than Lego does. Another thing that's happening is that all of the other toys you could buy have moved their production to China. And so other toys are getting less expensive. Right at this period in time, in the late 90s, the Danish kroner is getting stronger against the dollar. So in the biggest, in the biggest market, the US, Lego is getting more expensive, but other toys from say Hasbro and Mattel are getting less expensive because they've moved their production to China. And lastly, the brick was patented in 1958. And so all the patents ran out in the 80s. And to this day, you go to any store that sells Lego and right next to it is a brick that looks like Lego, snaps together with Lego for half the price or less. This is a tough market, right? What do you do? Right? You know what doesn't work, right? You know that it's not going to work to just put out another box of bricks. Well, two years before, um, in 19, 1997, a Harvard Business School professor named Clay Christensen had just written a book called The Innovator's Dilemma. And The Innovator's Dilemma puts out this idea that there are such things as disruptive technologies. And disruptive technologies will at first appear not very good, right? The early digital cameras were not very good. The pictures were very muddy and, and the cameras were expensive. But over time, technology changes very rapidly and customers tastes don't. And so what starts as this low end, low quality um, technology actually disrupts the industry from below and takes over. And so Lego fell prey to this idea that disruptive revolutionary innovations were going to change the nature of play and that they, should, they needed to get on board and they needed to really think about what the future of play was. And so they did an exercise inside the company and I'm spending time on this because these are not dumb people. These are not um, thoughtless managers that just jumped into the latest fad. They really care about the quality of play and they're smart and they care about the company and they almost bankrupted it. And so I wanna talk about what happened here um, because the other side they did is they, they kind of did a, an internal audit and they said, you know, yes, we're in a tough market. And yes, we've become a little separated and complacent from the market, but we still have smart people. Um, even after the layoff, we've got a healthy bank account. We've got um, great relationships with our retailers for the most part. And we've got a very strong brand and customers that love us. And so if anybody can reinvent the future of play, it's us. And so they challenged themselves to do it. They, they created a new... Um, mission statement. We want the Lego brand to become the world's strongest brand among families with children by 2005. Um, this was touted in a McKinsey and other case study of, of, you know, a company really responding to the disruption threat. And, you know, they became convinced that, you know, if all they offered was another box of bricks, they'd, they'd become a commodity, if not bankrupt, and they needed to reinvent the future of play before somebody else did. They needed to disrupt themselves before somebody else did. And I'll come back and ask you, you, you know this ends badly, right? I told you that already, but uh, why? So let me tell you a couple things that they did. One, uh, they came out with a whole new play experience around an action figure called Galador. And Galador had this TV show. They went, out to, um, they went out to Hollywood and commissioned a TV show, but it also embedded, um, uh, 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 it, it embedded some electronics in the toy and had some ultrasonic um, uh, signals from the TV show. So if you watched the TV show with your toy, it would talk back to the TV show. So it created this immersive experience. It's like you're actually with a, a living, breathing, talking uh, action figure. And they created some other things like a video game and uh, a spaceship and everything. So they wanted to create more than just an action figure, but this kind of immersive uh, play experience with the action figure that combined digital and physical. 
they did some market research. They found that most kids don't like construction toys. And so they created a whole line of toys called Jack Stone. And what was different about Jack Stone was that it, um, it had many fewer pieces. And you can kind of see it here, right? Th these are big, chunky pieces that snap together very quickly. And so it really is more about play and less about construction. You know, there's no big complex construction experience. You snap together the pieces in a couple minutes and you're off and playing. This is a fire rescue set. Um, they explored electronic toys for toddlers, you know, where they, this one is called the music roller and you plug a, a little mushroom in and, and it plays a different song depending on which mushroom you plug in when the toddler drags it behind him. Um, this one is called the story builder and you, um, you put cards in the front three slots and depending on what cards you choose and what order you put them in, it'll tell you a different story. So kind of this modular, a little bit Lego-y um, uh, set of, of toys for toddlers that gets them into the electronic space. They open up Lego lands. They figure that this new um, definition of Lego, they need to explain it and let kids explore it through physical experiences. So they open up Lego lands in California and Munich and, and the UK. They've had one in Denmark uh, since the 60s, um, but that's been the only one around the world. And now they open up new ones. And they come out with Bionicle, which you know, it's a, a box of plastic pieces that snap together, but it's unlike any Lego before or since, and is controversial to this day among uh, Lego aficionados. And they even experiment with virtual Lego building. So they create something called the Lego Digital Designer, where you can grab pieces from an online palette, snap them together in this 3D virtual space, and... Um, and then later they connect it to a fulfillment operation. So you can set, upload your designs. They'll send you just the pieces you need to build them. And then you can offer your design for sale virtually around the world to other kids. And then lastly, and it may not seem like a major thing, but for the first time in 1999, they licensed somebody else's story as a basis for a play theme. So 1999 was episode one, right? The first movie in the second trilogy for Star Wars. And that's the first Lego Star Wars toys. Two years later, they come out with the first Harry Potter movie. And of course, the first Lego Harry Potter toys. And all this falls apart um, in 2003 and 2004. Now, let me ask you, what went wrong, right? So again, I'm gonna go back and, and move us over to the next question. What did Lego do wrong? Now, there's kind of three possibilities for this. Remember, their assessment of the problem was that if all we offer is another box of bricks, you know, an incrementally better product for our current customer, that we're going to become a commodity, if not bankrupt. There's lots of other brick makers doing playthings out there, and they're just going to come after us, and we're going to become one of many, and profits and growth are going to go away. So... We need to reinvent the future of play before somebody else does. So was that, was that the wrong problem or was that the right problem, but they chose the wrong solutions? And I haven't told you all of them, but I've given you a feel for what the solutions were. Or did they try and do the right thing, but just execute it badly? So think about that. And I'm going to tell you what happened with some of these toys. So Lego Explore, these electronic toys for toddlers, I think these were actually very good toys. Um, you know, I think they would have done very well if they'd had, say, a Fisher Price brand on them. But um, what I, I met the guy whose job it was to get these into stores, and he said people would look at him and they'd say, "What are you doing? Right? This isn't Lego." And when they got them into stores, people would look at them and see the Lego brand, and they kind of get confused, like that, that's not a Lego toy, and walk away. So they took a lot of money and time to develop, and they were. Uh, disasters, expensive failures. Uh, Jack Stone, in a way, was even a worse failure because, um, you know, it's easy to see in retrospect that if you make a box of plastic pieces with a Lego brand on it, um, kids that don't like construction toys aren't going to buy it. And kids that do like construction toys, Lego's core customer base, they would buy it and they were hoping for that, you know, that, that detailed immersive um, construction experience that's so rewarding for some kids. And instead they get, you know, 20 pieces they'd snap together in a couple of minutes and they'd feel cheated. And so all this did was it drove away Lego's best customers at a time when they needed them most. 
And it was also an expensive failure. Now, those of you who understand injection molding will know that the bigger and more complex the piece is, the more expensive the mold is. And um, injection molding is basically a fixed cost business. So if you have an expensive mold and you don't produce many pieces because the product doesn't sell, which the Jack Stone line did not sell, then you get the cost per piece upwards of a dollar or more. So they were losing money like crazy on, on this toy. Galador, you know, they just kind of got themselves into a business they didn't understand. In particular, um, nobody wanted an action figure from Lego, uh, so nobody bought it. And the TV show, when they went out to, um, to Hollywood to commission the TV show, um, they overmanaged it. They didn't really understand how to let a, an artist have the creative freedom they needed to do a good TV show. And you can look this up on IMDb or some online rating service. It was so bad that almost everybody who acted in it never acted in anything ever again, right? It wasn't just bad. It kind of killed the careers of the people involved with it. Uh, and then, you know, Lego Star Wars and Lego Harry Potter were successful toys, but were actually one of the biggest reasons why Lego almost went bankrupt um, because they didn't understand the cyclicality. Right? So in 1999, I don't know if you went to, uh, to a toy store to try and buy, uh, say, a Lego Star Wars to toy in December of 1999, but what you saw was a couple feet, you know, a meter or two of empty shelf space um, because they didn't make enough. They didn't uh, predict how successful it would be. So, uh, and that's the worst thing for Lego. I mean, Lego is almost a fixed cost business. They buy ABS plastic at around a dollar a pound, about, you know, two euros per kilo. Um, and they sell it to us for 50 times that, you know, for $50 a pound or 100 euros per kilo. And so, um, you know, the last thing you want to do with that kind of gross margin is stock out. And so they, you know, think about what they would do in the following year in 2000. Remember, 1999 was the first Lego Star Wars toys. So 2000, they produce a whole lot more Lego Star Wars toys with different, um, you know, different models and so forth. Well, there's no movie in 2000. Uh, and so they didn't understand the business, in particular, how cyclical the demand would be. And so their demand drops, but supply goes up. And all of a sudden, there's lots of returns and discounting. And it's a separate kind of disaster. The following year, in 2001, is the first Harry Potter movie. And so those do really well. They've just screwed up an ERP implementation. They tried to uh, implement SAP and it was a disaster. And so they didn't really have any understanding of product line profitability. I mean, they're hardly the only company to screw up an ERP implementation at the end of the 90s. In 2002, there's actually the second movie, episode two of Star Wars and the second Harry Potter movie, but there's no movie from either franchise in 2003 or the or first half of 2004. Sales drop from uh, 10.1 billion Danish kroner. There's five to seven to the dollar or to the euro from 10.1 down to 6.3 in just three years, almost a 40% drop and the company's almost bankrupt. So what went wrong? You know, do, do you think that they solved the wrong problem or did they try and solve the right problem but chose the wrong solutions? Or do they choose the right solutions but executed them badly? Because your assessment of this will affect what you do next, right? Depending on what answer you choose here, you will do something different next. So let's see what you came up with. Oof, pretty evenly split between one and two. Um, but slightly more on two. Um, to some degree, it is all three of these. Um, but I would argue, and I will argue, that is, it is primarily number two. It is primarily that they tried to solve the right problem, but chose in a very fundamental way the wrong solutions. And I'll explain why I, uh, I believe that. So uh, one thing that happens then is that they go through a crisis and they have this, you know, one, one of the benefits of a crisis is that it is a marvelous um, uh, focusing mechanism to convince people to do things differently. Um, so they, uh, they have to do another layoff, another round of layoffs. Uh, they, uh, 
they take out some emergency loans, they sell off some real estate, they do, uh, they, they outsource their production uh, from high cost Denmark to the Czech Republic, which is much lower cost. They um, actually contract with a contract manufacturer to make Lego bricks for a while, a decision they regret later, um, but they survive and they learn something from their brush with bankruptcy. And I'll tell you what they learned just through two quick toy stories. The one success, the shining success that kept Lego in business during the worst of its financial crisis in 2003 and 2004 was Bionicle. This toy, um, what was unique about it was how kind of cinematic its stories were, right? It has these heroes that have this um, battle against evil to rescue this land called Matanui. And um, here's the original concept drawings of, of uh, a guy named Christian Faber, um, where these heroes wash up on the island of Matanui and assemble themselves and do battle in different parts. And every year there's a different story. So, you know, in one, one year it's on the ground and another year it's, uh, it's underwater one year, it's up in the air, it's, uh, it, it's uh, in this, inside this cave, um, this kind of damp cave and at the end. Um, and so every year there's a different story with different characters, different good guys and bad guys, and it becomes a collectible, right? If you don't get the 2003 characters by the end of December of 2003, then they're gone. And January of 2004, there's a whole different set of characters and a different story. And so the collectible aspect really gets kids to save up their allowance and you know, buy the toys. But what Lego learned from Bionicle was that there's a big difference between sufficient and necessary. And I'll explain what I mean by that. So what they learned was that, you know, when they started putting out complementary products to the Bionicle toy, so they put out books, comic books, the biggest, uh, the most popular comic book in the world was the DC Comics about Bionicle for many years. The most popular young adult fiction in the US for many years was the Scholastic books about Bionicle. But when they brought out PC games, and when they brought out direct to digital, you know, direct to DVD movies, digital offerings, what they found is that they didn't get disrupted. That in fact, people, kids who played the video game for Bionicle wanted more boxes of plastic pieces, not fewer. And so all these things brought in more revenue, right? When kids wore the t-shirts or the pajamas or carried the toys or the backpacks or wore the Nike sneakers or anything like that, they became walking advertisements. When they read the comic books or books, they realized that they needed all six of the good guys to do battle with the six of the bad guys. And so they go out and buy more and they realized that from the games too. But what they learned was that digital didn't disrupt, that it actually complemented and that you know, what they got wrong was the difference between sufficient and necessary. It was not sufficient to just offer a box of plastic pieces um, that you assemble in some construction experience, but it was necessary to do that. When they went away from that, customers left the brand. They said, if you're not going to make a construction toy, we'll go somewhere else that can do, you know, action figures or, or electronic toys for toddlers better. You know, and so it was necessary, but it was not sufficient. When they came back to the brick and innovated around the brick, around that construction experience, told stories, had games, et cetera, that's when, thing, that's when customers returned to the brand and profitability returned to the company. And it actually ended up, and we'll talk about this in, we talk about this a lot in, in uh, innovation in existing markets. Um, it ended up really changing their development process to being much more customer focused, uh, much more, there's a lot of elements of design thinking, uh, although this happened before design thinking became such a big thing and became a word. Um, and now what Lego does is it goes out and it gets a bunch of kids and it shows them pictures of, you know, like, tell us what's happening in this picture. And they'll show kids pictures and see what, you know, say, tell us a story about what's happening. And sometimes kids get really excited and sometimes they're just kind of ho-hum and they really love this picture of ninjas. Lego has this great expression. There's only two groups of honest people in the world, kids and drunks. You know, kids will never lie to you about whether something's fun. And so they develop over the course of this iterative customer focused process you know, what is the story and, and who, who, what do ninjas, who do ninjas battle? And they go back and forth. And, um, 
you know, they, they really had to figure out who the bad guys were. And so they asked kids, can you guess, by the way, who the bad guys were? If ninjas are the good guys, who are the bad guys? It turns out seven-year-olds had a very clear view that since ninjas were real historical figures, it couldn't be lizards or robots or monkeys. It had to be skeletons. I mean, seven-year-old logic, right? And so um, they developed this toy. They develop a game called Spinjitsu. They um, come up with a good TV show uh, and a video game and comic books and events at the Lego store where you can practice the game against others and win prizes. And all those things lead to this tremendously successful toy. And so what Lego did and what many other companies have done is really not innovating inside the box, right? It's not coming out with an incrementally better version of your current product for your current customer. Although I would argue that that is the most important type of innovation. If you're not good at that, you can't do anything else. That's kind of the table stakes for most markets. But what they did is also not outside the box, revolutionary disruptive innovation. I'm a disruption skeptic. Uh, not that it doesn't happen, but that, you know, there's a lot of failure and it's often expensive and difficult but rather it's innovation around the box, that it's uh, honoring the product that made your company great. And it's really understanding what else you can do to help make that product more compelling, more useful, more valuable. And, um, and really the fundamental process for innovating around the box is to number one, start by honoring your current product, and then really try to understand what people are trying to do with your product. And so it becomes, uh, the best metaphor I've heard from this is that, and this is from one of the companies that I feature in my second book, is that this is innovation as dating, not fighting. Um, if you think about innovation as fighting your competitor, then you always watch what they're doing. How can they, you know, how can you do what they do a little better, faster, cheaper? But if instead you think about it as dating your customer, right? So what do they care about? What are their hopes and dreams? Like when you met that sp special person in your life, you realize that you know you wanted to become a bigger part of their life. Well, you tried to understand who they were and what they cared about. And that's the way we should think about innovation is dating our customer, not fighting our competitor. And so in our course, we'll talk about Lego, of course. Um, you know, my favorite <laughs> critique of the course, you know, we always ask for in all our executive education programs, you know, suggestions for how we could uh, make the course better. My favorite critique of, of my teaching was, that guy likes Lego a little too much. Um, and so, you know, guilty, right? I mean, uh, I, I'm, I decided to own that. Um, but we don't only talk about Lego. We drop Lego after the first uh, two hours of the course, and we start focusing on other companies, both B2B and B2C, uh, service and product, you know, industrial and consumer, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and try to use a range of stories to really pull out the principles and the process um, that are necessary to do this approach to innovation. So uh, I told you I'd take 20 minutes and I'm sorry I've taken uh, 35, but, uh, and by the way, I've got six more hours of stuff about Lego. So I will, <laughs> I will stop talking now and just open it up to questions. Uh, thanks, Dave. Uh, as, as always, this is uh, fascinating. Uh, and I think a really compelling story. Some questions are starting to come in and maybe I can start with one that struck me just with the point that you were making at the end. How do you think of this idea of innovating around the box relative to, you know, the, the very topical notion of platforms and platform strategies for, uh, for businesses? Yeah, so platforms are often um, ways of assembling a range of different things for a customer. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you, if you have, MIT has done some of the foundational work in, in these business platforms where it, you will have a group of customers that say, I mean, we all know, say, hotels.com, right? And that's a platform business. And they will come in and they will offer you, of course, not just the hotel, but the flights, the, um, the, the tour guide, the rental cars, the other services related to make a great vacation or a great business trip. And so it is a way to assemble a kind of ecosystem of, of different, um, up, uh, different vendors that all want to help uh, make that more complete experience. Um, Lego, I think, is different than that. Um, you know, the whole concept of ecosystem, I think, is a really interesting one. And it's a term I often hear about that I push back on because um, 
people often don't remember the first person who talked about business ecosystems. It was a guy named Jeffrey Moore. And he wrote about the IBM PC uh, and how they'd created this ecosystem of vendors, you know, which included Microsoft and Intel. And we all know how that story ended for IBM, right? That all the profits migrated to Microsoft and Intel and some others. Logitech, right? Logitech got a lot more um, profit from being a complementary set of products like mice and, and uh, sound systems and keyboards than IBM did for the core product itself. Um, and so uh, it, it um, what Lego does is much more of a kind of loose chaotic ecosystem and much, much less of a loose, loose chaotic ecosystem and much more of a kind of, I, I like the idea of a family of products and services. Um, and so they're thinking about, you know, what is the pricing model? What is the service? What are the complementary products? What's the events at the Lego store? What's the TV shows? What's the movies? How, how can we get kids involved in this world and put it all together? But it's very much, you know, any of us who are, who are parents have had that moment with the kids where you're saying, I don't care whether you want to do this or not. We're doing this as a family, right? And so the, the people who are part of that family don't often like uh, what has to be done, but they recognize that it's best overall um, for, the, uh, uh, for, the, for the, the portfolio of products and for the customer. Great, thank you. And early on, when you, uh, in, in your presentation, uh, I'm just looking back up. Ethne, I think, uh, asked them, I thought a quite interesting question uh, about you know during this the time of this story, one of the other innovation stories was about open innovation uh, and, and also uh, something that's been explored a lot here at MIT: the notion of your customer-led innovation, where really your customers can can help you with innovation. Do, do you see those concepts fit into into the Lego story or into you know other examples that you talk about in the course? Wow, these are great questions. Um, open innovation, I think, is a very interesting one um, because Lego uh, became more open as it became more open in its um, development process um, and more customer focused. It became more open overall, and now they have something called Lego Ideas, uh, where people can submit ideas for Lego sets, and they've got some wonderful ones they brought to market. Um, and the people uh, who have suggested the winning sets have actually gotten a fair amount of money from them. Um, and what was the second part of that question, Peter? The, the customer-led innovation as well. So, so you know how, how companies in some cases have been able to use their their most innovative customers to help them drive their own innovation. Yeah, so they do some of that, um, again, through that open innovation. Um, Customer-led is interesting one, uh, is an interesting one, because I don't think Lego would say, you know, we let our customers decide our playthings, but rather they go through that process that I talked about very quickly with Ninjago, where they go out and they have Lego people create these ideas for playthings, and then they take them out and they show them to seven-year-olds. And, you know, sometimes the seven-year-olds just kind of look at it like, oh, that's kind of cool. But other times they, you know, are jumping up and running around and, and really having a great time and, uh, and, and telling one story after another. And that's how they know they have a good play theme. So that is, that is customer focused, but it's not necessarily, I don't know if you call it customer led, right? I think there's a big distinction there where the creative ideas come from the experts that really know how to make a great Lego set but they stay very connected uh, to the customer and realize that the customer is often better at predicting whether uh, something's gonna be successful or not. Great. And uh, just looking up the list again, Brazo asked, I think quite a challenging question. I'll rephrase it slightly, uh, but he, he's wondering what the role of, in your view, of, of, of luck it might still be. Uh, that, you know, to what extent might there be a survivor bias or a selection bias in, in this particular story? Uh, you know, have you got examples of others that, uh, that, that maybe would reinforce that this wasn't just good luck uh, in this case for Lego? Yeah, and I showed it on that slide, right? Uh, the, you, you can go through this um, process that I've tried to codify in my second book, and you can see that it's how Apple turned itself around. It's how GoPro got five years of 90% growth. It's how Sherwin-Williams gets... Um, uh, uh, really twice the price per gallon of paint than 
paints that are really functionally equivalent, you know, rated just as well by independent rating services. It's uh, uh, Marvel Comics. You, you can just replace Lego with Marvel and you really have almost the same story, um, except they went further down and came back further. Um, and so uh, there, are, there are failure examples. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you one of the difficult parts of this is that when you start to do this with your product, you may find that it takes you in a direction that is unexpected. So Lego kept banging its head against the digital play experience. Everybody kept saying, oh, you know, you, you should create virtual brick-based things. And, you know, we, somebody was talking about that uh, digital computer to design system for Lego. Nick Schwartz was, mentioned it. And um, that was an expensive failure um, because what Lego has learned again and again is that parents often buy Lego for their kids to get them off screens, right? They want them to get away from screens. And continually, because Lego is more customer focused now, you know, they're being led away from, say, doing things like Electronic Arts or Sony or, you know, one of those gaming companies and more and more toward being like Disney. You know, they're opening up more and more theme parks. They're doing this amazing thing where they take over closed down department stores like JCPenney's or Macy's. You've heard about the death of retail. Well, Lego's taking over those stores, turning them into indoor playgrounds, filling them up with bricks and opening them up as really expensive, overgrown Lego stores where kids can go in on a rainy day like we're seeing in New England today. And kids can run around and burn off energy and, they, and the parents can you know, sit in a cafe and drink coffee and use the free Wi-Fi. And, um, and you have to pay 20 or $30 per person to get in. And then you have to walk out through a Lego store, but it's been quite successful for them. Um, and, and so they're, they're becoming with the movies, of course, the, the theme parks, the, the indoor playgrounds, the Lego stores, they're becoming more and more Disney-like every day. And they tried and tried and tried to do digital stuff and customers again and again told them, no, we don't want you to do that. We want you to be more like Disney and less like Sony. Great. Uh, there's been, I think people have been very uh, interested in resonating with uh, the idea you talked about honoring your products and your, your existing uh, customer base and trying to innovate uh, around that. You know, are, are there instances though uh, that, that you've come across where, uh, you know, it's either already too late to do that. You know, that you, you didn't sort of the companies that didn't sort of move quickly enough, uh, they could, they had opportunities and they, uh, and, and they really missed them. Or are there uh, examples, and some of them I think probably talked a lot about in business schools, uh, where actually the you know the core product and the core customer base uh, would, would, were just not going to be able to survive. In other words, are there instances where the approach you're advocating just won't work? Yeah, right. I mean, no amount of innovating around the film camera would have saved Kodak, right? I mean, their disruption is a real thing, and it does happen. Um, no amount of innovating around, uh, you know, the blast furnace, the integrated steel manufacturing process would have prevented the mini mill from coming up and, and really changing the way a lot of steel is made. And so it's, um, you know, the disruption does happen. Uh, what I would argue is that, you know, any innovation leader needs to have in their toolbox a range of different approaches. And I think what we've learned a lot, maybe from Silicon Valley, but also more generally, is that, you know, if, if your product is getting commoditized or it's tired or it's, you know, competition is coming up, maybe it's coming out of, you know, Asia in a, in a low cost way or whatever, if, if that's happening, well, then maybe you want to put some uh, resources into exploring those revolutionary and disruptive innovations. I think you should. Right? That's an important uh, avenue to explore. But don't put all your good people on it and lots of money on it until you've tried maybe a couple other things. So are there some complementary products and services? Is there a new channel to market? Is there a new uh, pricing plan or financing plan? Is there some kind of event? Is there some kind of community option? Is there something you can do that would complement the product, make it more valuable, and help, um, help your customers um, get more value from it. And so that's what we're advocating here. And, you know, there's a wonderful metaphor, another metaphor that I like called playing the innovation piano. 
and this is not original to me, you might have heard it before. Um, but often we as companies, we play the same key on the piano. We just bang on that middle C key because we made a product yesterday. Well, we're going to make another product today and we're going to make another product tomorrow. And if sales flag, then we're just banging the key faster and harder. Um, but maybe we should play other keys. Maybe we should look at a service. Maybe we should look at a channel to market. Maybe we should look at some kind of event. Maybe we should look at a community feature. Maybe we should look at a financing plan. Maybe we should play chords, not keys, multiple complementary innovations that harmonize to create something much better than any key alone. Um, and that's what we explore. That's hard because often it means more people involved in innovation, um, moving outside of your core expertise and um, working with companies outside. So it kind of expands the complexity of innovation in multiple dimensions. Um, but when you do it, um, and we talk about, by the way, how to do it in you know, a first, second, third, and how you can do kind of a, a minimum viable portfolio of complementary innovations, right? What is the minimum set of things that will really help you do that um, and how you get into this? Um, but you know, sometimes you have no choice that that's the way your company is going to continue. And coming back to that, um, that first point, you know, uh, the question of the first question that any company should ask themselves is what made us great? You know, what, what was that, uh, that product or service that really made this company what it is today and honor that and respect it and realize that there's a lot of customers that count on you for it. You know, Lego, when they went away from the brick, they really hurt the feelings of their customers. There was a lot of people that loved Lego that really felt like they were cheated, like they were disrespected, like they, you know, they were angry at the management, physically angry at the management. And when it came back, they were just, just so happy. And so, you know, the, the whole process actually starts with a counterintuitive question of kind of where are we not going to change things? Where are we not going to innovate? You know, what is it we did yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and we're going to do again tomorrow? And how do we, you know, how do we start, you know, with that as a foundation, as a base, and innovate around that? And I would argue that that gives you kind of a stable foundation to innovate that disruption doesn't and, and revolutionary things don't and makes it kind of easier to innovate and less risky to innovate. So that resonates, Dave, with some questions, a uh, theme of questions that I've been seeing as well uh, here that uh, you, this uh, has been very much about strategy in many ways, uh, this, 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 this discussion that you've been uh, leading. But what is the role of people? You, know, what, you talked to, you know, early on in the presentation about sort of the role of the founder and, uh, and future CEOs. Uh, you talked about the impact of uh, of the layoffs and sort of the, the, the connection between the company and, uh, and, and its business environment, you know, on a national basis, as it were. So, so what is the role of people? Uh, you know, how, what's the balance between, you know, the iconoclastic leader making the, you know, the, the inspired top-down decision versus the need to have innovation uh, as a culture throughout the organization? What's your view of that? Yeah, and, and I think it really... Um... Uh, what Lego was able to do, and again, uh, you know, I talk about Lego, but um, uh, because we've just talked about the story, but, you know, we, uh, when we do the, the course, we uh, focus very much on other companies that have had similar experiences. But uh, when you become more customer focused, and when you're going out there and really trying to understand what customers care about and what they're trying to do with your products, um, then uh, you can bring back into the company the need for different things from a messaging standpoint, from a service standpoint, from a product standpoint, from a financing standpoint, et cetera, et cetera, from a delivery standpoint. And that can really help um, make the case within the company that things have to change. But it can be very hard because people that had one job, you know, last year will have a different job this year and often they are just not comfortable with that. And it's the case in many companies that I've seen that some people just don't make the transition. That, you know, if the, if the product engineers held all the power in the company, it was just working with a German company like that, a very kind of precision, high-end uh, industrial technology company, and the engineers held, held all the value, but really the, 
their product had become commoditized and they needed to become a, a better solution for their customers. And that led to some real challenges in the company. Um, and so understanding what the value proposition is and then getting your people um, oriented behind it, you know, Lego had the luxury of a, of a crisis, um, but there's ways around it. It just involves, you know, a, of course, good leadership, but it also involves, you know, making that case within the company. And um, well, for Lego, you know, there's that old phrase that sometimes managing change is changing managers. We all want to avoid that if we can, um, but they had to do some of that. Yeah, that's a very interesting uh, point. And actually, it, it relates to uh, a couple of other questions. Uh, I'm just looking through Colleen Caruso, I think, was uh, expressed this very well, which is, you know, what, what's the role of brand in, 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 in this uh, uh, construct that, that, that you have here, that to the extent that, uh, you know, you're talking about existing success, an existing successful company with a well-known brand uh, versus, I suppose, you know, somebody that isn't a known brand and can they can, yet, you know, do, do these principles apply equally if you're uh, building something where you're not really trying to leverage an existing uh, customer base and brand recognition? Yeah, there's some companies that have just started up this way. Um, so again, I'll go back to GoPro. I think GoPro is an interesting example of both. Um, you know, they had their five years of 90% growth. And then of course they had the big drop and flattening um, because of disruption, by the way. I mean, that's kind of an interesting example where um, GoPro, for those of you not familiar, make a, a rugged waterproof camera that's great at capturing your greatest adventures. And they did exactly this approach to innovation and they had huge success. But then smartphones got not just better at video, but also more rugged and waterproof. And so what you're finding is that a lot fewer people buy GoPros. People still do, but also there's other comp competitors that are good and people have caught up. And so there's some disruption as well as just um, catch, catching up. But GoPro is still a, a nice, healthy business. Um, but they, uh, you know, they've really started from scratch that way and, and um, able to execute. Uh, other companies have adopted the approach in response to competitors, right? That they see their competitors doing and realize and that that's the new terms of competition in the market. Great. I think that's a, that's a, is a very good example. And as uh, has happened before, we're almost out of time. So perhaps I can ask you sort of just a closing question with hopefully a uh, not too long uh, answer, Dave, which is uh, if people are struck by or resonate with what you've been saying today, what, you know, what, what do you think, uh, what would you recommend they do as soon as uh, uh, this call finishes or maybe when they get into the office uh, tomorrow? Is there sort of one first step that people should take? Yeah, you know, in, in a way, um, another title for this course could be Beyond Design Thinking. Um, so if you are trained in that kind of anthropological approach to really understanding your customers' needs, and we do talk about that. We do a kind of a mini refresher on design thinking for those of you who haven't had the training. Um, but often uh, what, what happens in design thinking is that you throw out all the good stuff. You come back from, you know, really thoughtful, good, customer research and you come back in and you throw away anything that doesn't look like a product feature. Well, what we've, uh, what I hope you would take away from my program and, and generally um, from this approach is that sometimes some of that other stuff uh, that you've collected can give you ideas for maybe new partnerships or new things that you could do to complement your product. So I think the first thing to do is to go back and, and talk to your customers in a different way and just say, okay, Let's take the product as given and let's start to think about what else we could do that would help you get more value from the product. And that would be the question to ask. Great. That sounds like uh, a, a really good recommendation. And if I may make a recommendation, another thing that someone could do is uh, look up Dave's course. I think we have it on the screen right now uh, and encourage you to uh, come and spend more time uh, with Dave Robertson. This has been uh, fantastic. Thank you, Dave, uh, as always, for uh, educating and inspiring us. Thank you all for uh, joining us uh, from all over the world. We appreciate it. It's the middle of the night for some of you. Uh, it's incredible to see you all. Uh, we'll look forward, hopefully, to seeing many of you uh, at our next webinar on September the 2nd, 
which is uh, another very topical uh, question of how, uh, as we're all returning uh, to different hybrid models of work, uh, can we use the latest research uh, from our colleagues, in particular, Professor Aaron Kelly, uh, to design and implement the best possible systems for doing hybrid work? So hopefully you will, many of you will be able to join us for that as well. Thank you again, Dave Robertson. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, it's been a pleasure. We'll look out for the next webinar and for the recording uh, of this one uh, so that it can continue to give value to you uh, beyond the last 60 minutes. Thank you all. Take care, Dave. Thanks again.